Y'all ready for today? Well, I got a word for you today because God wants to do some things in your life that I want you to be ready for. Because God is relevant. He knows the situations that we face right today. And God has an awesome things in store for us. But we need to be ready and be prepared in our hearts to walk with him through those challenges. So bow your heads and let's pray together as we go to the word today. Father in heaven, thank you that you have given to us your Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, to empower us in all the facets of life. Today, almighty God, may the word that you have for us come alive to us. May it be so simple and so clear that we understand it and are inspired to walk in it. Lord, today, have your way. We surrender our hearts and our minds so that you in truth may unfold the revelation that you have that we might see and understand. We commit ourselves to you today. Let your will be done, we pray, in our lives today, here on earth, as it is in heaven. And we pray this in the name of our risen Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Everybody in agreement with that, say amen. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about defining moments. Does anybody know what a defining moment is? Do you know what a defining moment is? See, all of us face points in our lives that are defining moments. Today, what I want through this message is to help you to be ready for yours. Because what a defining moment is in simplicity, it's a point in which the character and the nature of a person is revealed. Whenever we face challenges or opportunities, it's what we decide in the midst of it. It's what we do. It's the direction that we take. It's the, it's the way in which we respond to those things to determine who we are, what we're made of, the, 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 the decisions of our lives based on the reality of our beliefs, what, we, what our faith holds, what, what we are in essence. It's in those challenges, it's in those opportunities that we discover and they, sh they mold, they shape, they define the outcomes of our lives because our decisions determine our destinies. And so what I want you to be a, a, a aware of is this, because why? We don't know when they're coming. Life just happens. But we need to be ready for them because life is not as much about what happens to me is or it is more about what or how I respond to what happens to me. So life, again, is not as much about what happens to me as it is as much about how I respond to what happens to me. Because those defining moments of my responses determine my destinies. And God has so much more for us than we often allow him to do in us. And that's why I want to get you to be prepared for it because they come in all forms of ideas. It can come through a, an opportunity of a promotion at work, through a business opportunity. It can come about through a temptation, through a relationship challenge or opportunity. They present themselves in different ways. And how we respond to them. You know, I'm thinking about today as I was preparing, you know, some of the defining moments to my life when I was just 22 years old and had the opportunity to go into business for myself, see, nobody would have understood. Being raised, growing up in my household, I didn't have a great self-esteem because my mom died when I was eight. My father never had anything good to say about my life. So when I came to Christ at 20 years of age, God began to build in me a confidence because he was my father. And so when the opportunity to go out into business for myself, the only way in which that opportunity, I found the courage and the boldness to do it. it, wasn't because of an innate group of gifts that I felt that I had, but because I felt that God was bigger than the challenges before me, and he had something greater for my life. And walking out into them, I found God to be faithful, that not only did he cause me to be successful, he caused me to prosper in those things, but they also come in the forms of challenges. When I faced, and I kind of shared this with you a few months ago, the, one of the, the, probably the greatest challenge of my life, when I faced the opportunity of someone being unfaithful to me, in a marriage when someone was, you know, when, if you guys don't know this before, I was married before my precious wife now, and I had faced two rounds of infidelity. And when I was faced with the reality, because nothing, I mean, people say to me, you don't know what I've gone through in my life. You have no idea how low I feel. Oh, yes, I do, more than you realize. Because I felt like the greatest loser in the world. And when I realized 
My life was unraveling before me in the way in which it was. I had a decision to make. How would I respond to it? Would I allow the circumstances to define who I was? Or would I allow my faith to determine who I was? Because it's so, I understand when you've been hurt. I understand when you feel devastated by the decisions of others. But I determined that day, I had the decision to make, would I be bitter or would I allow God to make me better? And I chose to be better and not bitter. And God was so faithful to come through in the midst of it. That's why today, it doesn't matter where you've been. I want you to give, I want to give hope to you that no matter what decisions might have defined your life before, you can make new determinations and decisions because God is faithful. God is ready to show up in your life in ways more than you have even thought or imagined. And that's why I want you to be challenged here. In fact, if you have a Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You need a Bible reading? Just find the beginning of the Bible. Go first, past the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Go past the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, Ruth, and you'll be in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17, because we're gonna deal with a very, familiar story. If you weren't raised in church, you probably have heard this story sometime along the venture of your life. Somebody has talked about it. Maybe you've experienced somewhere else. It's about something that defined an individual in the Bible. Because even if you're, again, if you're not familiar with Bible truth, if you have ever heard about the greatest king who ever lived in the nation of Israel, his name was David, King David that there was an event that took place in his life that defined his life. Does anybody want to take a stab at what that event was? He faced a giant named Goliath. But you see, I want to help you today because David was ready. You don't know when an opportunity or a challenge will present itself but I want to encourage you because God will provide the opportunities for us to be ready to allow our faith to define us and not the circumstances of his life. You see, at this point in Israel's history, Israel had come out of the land of Egypt and God had led them into a place to become their own sovereign nation in the land of Cana. They had gone into what was called to them the promised land and established a nation and their original government was a theocracy where God had tempted to cause the people to live underneath him and trust him for the outcomes of their land, that God would lead and direct their nation, that they would live with respect for one another because they submitted to God's law, each one of them, and they all trusted in God to be their king. But it didn't go that well for the nation. They would have good times and bad times. God would raise up leaders and deliver them during times of crisis when their faith grew weary, but eventually the people wanted to be like the other nations of the earth. They wanted a king. And so when Samuel, who the book that we're looking into, was the leader of the nation, he was brokenhearted over the people's desire for a king because he felt that it was a rejection upon his own leadership. And God said, hey, Samuel, don't take this personally. It's not you, it's me that the people are struggling with. So I will in truth provide them a king. And so the first king that was selected over the nation of Israel was a man named Saul. Now Saul wasn't really ready for his defining moment. He didn't prepare on this end. Now he started off good in the race because when he was selected to be the king of Israel, his first response to it was, who am I? He was a very humble individual. And he said, when, when the prophet Samuel said, this is God's destiny for you, you will be the first king of Israel. He said, man, I'm from the least of the tribes of Israel. Benjamin was the smallest tribe. I'm from Benjamin and my family's lineage. We're the least of the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. So why would this be my destiny? Because here's something, he lacked a self-confidence, which is crazy when you read the story because Saul had the goods that we would look at in our society today to cause a guy especially to be successful because why? He was handsome and he was tall. He was a head and shoulders above all the other people in the land, okay? 
So, you know, you think about American presidents, most presidents are tall, 6'2 and above, right? President Obama's tall. Most presidents who've ever been the leader of this land have been tall. And so it's one of those things that, you know, people use as a natural asset or gifting to make them ready for their challenges. But Saul had all that, but he still lacked self-confidence. And even down to the point when they were electing him, when Samuel called the nation together and they saw the election of God that the tribe of Benjamin was selected and then out of the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's family was selected and then out of Saul's family, they looked for Saul and they're like, where is he? And the Lord had to give a word of knowledge to Samuel the prophet and say, he's hiding among the baggage. Yeah, it's a great book, man. You ought to really read this. So they had to go look for him because he was saying, Am I really ready for this challenge? But God showed up. The Spirit of the Lord came on Saul, and the Bible said he became like a different man. And he gathered the nation. He created the first collective army for the nation of Israel. He instituted taxation. He instituted the things to form government and centralize the power of Israel. And he was challenged at first because this punk leader who named Nahash the Ammonite, he invaded a city in the land of Israel. And he was going to do, occupy them and make them his servants. And they wanted peace. They didn't want to be destroyed. And so they said, we will serve you if you won't kill us. He said, well, here's the terms of my deal. I'll cut off all your thumbs and take out your right eyes. See, Israel didn't have a centralized leader at this moment. Now Saul's challenge was here. Saul arose and led the nation of Israel to a great victory over Nahash, the Ammonite. And God was showing Saul the source of his confidence that his faith would define him if he were to believe in the Lord his God. Because the way in which you have become the leader and the success that you have had is because of me. But why wasn't he ready for his challenge? Because when God came to him and said, listen, this is an assignment I have for you. I want you to do this, that Saul could not fulfill what God asked him to do. He did his own thing because he became more confident in his giftings than in the God who gave him what he had. And when the, when prophet, the prophet Samuel confronted Saul and said, listen, you disobeyed what God told you to do. He tried to justify himself. He said, tried to say, no, I did what I was asked to do. And then when confronted about it, he made excuses. How many times have we done that? We have faced a challenge And our faith was at challenge and we made excuses. We made reasons and rationales why what God said didn't matter in that moment. See, your faith is what what God wants to define your life. And here we come to David and why. I tell you the backstory because when we begin this story, it really doesn't make sense. Other words, because it wasn't the conventional means of warfare. But you see, now there was a new challenge among the other nations because Israel had a leader and now he was a proven leader. He was a king. And so Israel's arch nemesis, the Philistines, decided to challenge this leader up front, but not in the conventional way. So they came out to wage war against Israel and they drew up battle lines and Saul gathered his army and he drew up a battle line against them. But The Philistines felt they had a secret weapon because what they really feared was the X factor. What about this new king? What about the anointing of his God upon his life? What we will do, we have this champion, this guy, Goliath. And here's something that's intimidating. Goliath was nearly 10 feet tall, nine foot nine, okay? And he had been trained in warfare since his childhood. He was a fierce weapon. But here's why it wasn't conventional warfare. Why not just attack Israel with Goliath? Because they feared. And so what they did was this. They were willing to risk Goliath. And what they were really trying to draw out was Saul. Because what they feared in the nation was the new leader named Saul. Saul was tall. Saul had the spirit of God on him. So here was the tactic of the Philistines when they came to war. Goliath, their champion, came out in the midst of the valley and he cried out and said, Israel, send out your best warrior to face me in battle. And if I defeat him, 
you will be our slaves. But if he defeats me, we the Philistine people will serve Israel as your slaves. So one-on-one -on -one combat in the valley, there I, where I say it's not conventional warfare. Because if they were so confident in Goliath being on their side, why not just attack Israel? They were trying to draw out Saul. Now they didn't know what had happened in the interim since his victory over Naash the Ammonite. They didn't know that the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And now Saul was a scaredy pants. Now Saul was a wimp. He didn't have what he had before. And so when this challenge came, all of Israel's soldiers, because Goliath would come out every day and defy the armies of Israel. He would trash talk every one of them. Say, what are you, a bunch of panty waste? Come on, isn't there a man in Israel? Isn't there one that will show up and face me? Just send one out. And if he defeats me, then we will be your slaves. And every day for 40 days, they line up. But the people of Israel, the soldiers on that line of battle are quaking in their boots. But you see, as Saul had begun to create an army, the way that his army was supplied, because the taxation in the land hadn't been sufficient enough to create all that was necessary to supply his army. So families sent resources to those who were in war for there to supply for the needs of the people. And so David was the son of a man named Jesse. Now this is the interesting part of the story that you need to understand. Jesse was a leader in the city of Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, of, of Bethlehem, okay? And he had eight sons. And why I mentioned the fact that he was a leader, he was a man of renown, he was a man of wealth, he was a man of influence, and he had eight boys. Three of them had gone to war with Saul. So he was concerned and wanted to supply the needs of his boys and get word from them of how they were doing because they didn't have cell phone connections or radio communications. How was the war going? What was going on? Everybody back home was nervous, was scared for their kids. So Jesse says to David, and here's why it's significant. David's role in the family at that time was a shepherd. And why is that significant? Because from a family of prestige, from a family of wealth, to have one of your sons be a shepherd was almost a disgrace for that son. Because that's, someone you, that's a job you hire someone to do or have slaves or servants in your household do. Jesse was a man of nobility. He was a man of means. And so David had a lowly place in his family. But David, here's his father. His father says, hey, David, listen, I want you to go down to Taco Bell. I want you to get a couple dozen tacos locos, a few uh, uh, Baja blasts and some burritos and head out and stop at the local KFC to get a bucket of chicken some mashed potatoes and some biscuits for, for the commanders over them because I heard they're from the South. They'll like the chicken. Head out and supply your brothers and help supply the needs. So David got up morning, got the fast food and headed out for the battle lines. And when he arrived, he gave the supplies to the commander in Sornathema and he went to his brothers, brought them the tacos and said, hey guys, dad wants to know how y'all are doing. I need to bring him a word. And while he's talking to his brother in the divine providence of God, Goliath gets up that day and goes on his rant that he would have done for the last 40 days. But this time, something's different among the army of Israel. Because a 17-year-old kid is there to witness what's going on. And Goliath, again, challenges and defies the nation of Israel and the armies of Israel and says, is there not a man among you. Are you a bunch of wimps? He starts trash talking, all this stuff. But yet now David is listening to this and say, wait a minute, did I hear what I just heard? Did he say what he just said? Is anybody listening to what this man is saying? David is becoming outraged. And he's wondering, he's going, dudes, come on. Are you all wimps? Does anybody listen to what he said? And then the soldiers begin to talk among each other because here's why Saul had abdicated his position. Now 
He was trying to sweeten the pot to get somebody to go out and do what he alone should have done. He promised three things to whoever would go out and fight Goliath. He promised them, number one, to make them wealthy. Number two, to marry his daughter who was beautiful, okay? And number three, to exempt his family from taxation. I mean, if number one and two weren't good enough, who loves to pay taxes? You don't have to be taxes for the rest of your life. Whoever would go out and face this challenger, the king would make wealthy, give his daughter in marriage and exempt him and his family from taxation. David says, are you kidding me? Who is this? And this is what he says. This uncircumcised Philistine. Why is that significant? Because circumcision was the right of a covenant with God. It's what defined the people of God as being God's people. And here's what David was saying. Dude, don't look at his height. Don't look at his clothes. Don't look at anything. God is on our side. Have you forgotten who we are? Have you forgotten what makes us what we are? We are the people of Israel. Our God is the God. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? David's going on like this, and the other dudes are listening to him, and they will go back and tell Saul. Saul calls for David. David comes before Saul, and David says to him, listen, king, don't worry about this situation anymore. Your servant will go out and defeat this giant. Saul looks at him and says, dude, you're just a youth. David was probably like 17 years old when all this was occurring. And Saul says to him, you're only a youth. And here's what David says, what nobody else knew. David says to him, yes, my Lord. But when your servant was tending his father's sheep, a bear came in and took one of those sheep. And I followed after it. And I killed the bear and saved the sheep. And then... A lion came in and grabbed one of the sheep and I chased the lion down. I overtook him, killed the lion and saved the sheep. What is this Philistine? The God who delivered the lion and the bear into my hands. This dude is nothing. And Saul's listening going, you killed a lion? You killed a bear? All right, dude, here's my armor. Go out. David tries on Saul's armor, walks around him and says, I'm unfamiliar with this. I need to go with what I know. What delivered me against the lion and the bear is more than sufficient to meet this challenge right now. Because I do not go out in my own name, but I go out in the name of the Lord of hosts. And so David grabs his shepherd's staff and then he goes over to the brook and he takes out five smooth stones and places it in his shepherd's pouch. Grabs one of them, puts it in his sling and heads straight towards Goliath. Goliath sees David coming out, assesses the fact that he's just a kid and he thinks this is some type of a joke. And he begins to defy David. He begins to mock him, call down curses upon him. And he said, what am I, a dog that you're throwing me a stick? What is this, a play toy? I am going to kill you, young man, and feed your flesh to the birds of the air. David hears all that and says, dude, you are a blowhard. Let me tell you this. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And here I tell you this, I will kill you today and feed your flesh to the birds of the air and I will take off your head and then all of, of the Philistine army will fall this day and everyone in the world will know that there is a God in Israel. See, David was not confident in just who he was, but in who the God who was with him, the God who was in him, the God who goes before him. David's confidence rested in God Almighty. And that's what I want you to know. God is not changed. 
The same God who was with David that day is the same God who stands ready no matter what challenge you face, no matter what difficulty you encounter in your life or whatever opportunity presents itself. God is still ready to meet you today to allow your life to be defined by what you believe as opposed to what other people say about you. So David runs right at Goliath, and we know the story. He takes that sling, he throws it, he hits Goliath right in the forehead. Those rock sinks in, he falls over dead. David runs up to him. I love this, this is so cool. He takes out his sword, cuts off his head. And if that ain't bad enough, this is really wild. You ought to read this, this is so cool. He takes his head, and he starts going, look, look what God did. He's holding Goliath's head in his hand. And when Saul finally calls in David, David, after the victory has been routed because the Philistines see what happened, they run in fear. Then Israel gets their courage. Then they chase after them. See, it always takes someone standing up for their faith to inspire and to encourage other people. My question to you is, why not you? Why can't God do something great in your life to inspire other people around you? Israel chases after the Philistines. A great victory happens that day. Saul calls for David, and he's still got Goliath's head in his hand. Ain't that so cool? It's kind of gross, but I'm like, wow. He's like, look, king, look what I did for you today. And he's like, no doubt about it, bro. And here's the point. What does this story mean to us? Here's what I want you to gain out. If you're taking notes with me, here's how, it, here's how it's relevant to you and I. Because you and I need to see this. Number one. What we can learn about being ready for your defining moment, it starts right now. Like I said, you can't tell when those challenges will arise, but it's what you do today that determines how you will be when the challenge comes your way or the opportunity. So number one, if you're taking notes with me, being faithful to someone else's prepares you for your own. Being faithful to someone else's. See, David was faithful, doing a menial job. He could have had attitude and said, why am I out here watching my father's sheep? I'm being disrespected. I'm not being given any level of privilege as a son of Jesse. Why do I even care about these sheep? Why would I put out my best? But David risked his very life. For what? His dad's sheep. They weren't his sheep. They were his father's sheep. And see, some of you are sitting there today and you go to jobs and you don't put out your best because you'll say, you know what? When my opportunity comes, when I'm head of the department, when I'm over my own business, then I'll give my best. But why? When everybody else around me is doing mediocre work, why don't I do it just enough to get by? But David was faithful with, with what was someone else's. And here's the principle that you need to understand from scripture. If you're not faithful, with what someone else's, why would God ever promote you to give you your own? Until you can show yourself as putting out, until you recognize that it's not about my coworkers, it's not about anybody else, it's not about the praise of man. What I do, I do before God and nothing goes beyond his notice. Why are you content to put out just mediocre work when there's so much more in you? There's greatness in you, but you need to arise to the challenge and be faithful now because promotion doesn't come from the north or the south. Promotion comes from almighty God. And the Bible says of Jesus that he will open doors that no one can shut. We want that door to open. We say, yeah, I'll do it when my chance comes. But those chances are passing you by because you're sitting in the land of mediocrity. You're not allowing excellence to guide your heart. You're not doing what you're doing from your heart as unto God. No matter what you do, God almighty sees it. And when you give out, when you do your best, God knows where your life is defined. See, that's the problem so often. You know, if you're renting someone else's house and you're waiting, you're not taking care of it, you guess what? Who do you think will ever give you your own? God Almighty wants to bless your life, but until you can take care of what is someone else's, why do you think someone will entrust more to you? The Bible says this, when we're faithful over little, God will make us ruler over much. See, who is your trust in? Does your faith define you? Or do the circumstances of your life define you? You say, well, I'm doing a mediocre job. I'm doing something I don't even like doing. I don't even want to go there. I don't want to do that. I'm not, I've been asked to do things that are, I think are beneath me. 
says who. If God has given you this to do, then recognize God is watching how you handle this to determine where he can take you in your life. We're waiting for the door to open and the whole time we're missing the opportunity because if you can't be faithful now with what you got, why do you think God will give you more? See, we have bought into a lie that somehow somebody owes us something, that somehow we're entitled to something in this life. Says who? Here's what the Bible says. God expects us to do our best in every setting, in every challenge. Do you remember the old, uh, Jesus said in the New Testament, there was a man and it was talking about God, the parable that Jesus was talking about. He gave talents to his servants. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, to another he gave one. Now, did he expect the guy who had one to do what the guy who had five did? No. He said, but the guy who had one said, it's not fair. He got five. And because I only got one, I'm not going to do anything with it. Because he is unkind. He is unfair. And when the Lord showed up, what did he say? You think I'm unfair? Where did you think he got the one from? Anything you have has come from me. If you are faithful with what I give you, then I will bring you on to more. Because in every situation, when they did with what they expected to do, with what they were given, see the guy who had two doubled his and God rewarded him for what he did. Why are you sitting there not doing with the challenge and the opportunities you have because you think it's beneath you? Because you think, here's the deal. Know this, where does your faith reside in? Your circumstances or in your God? Because the situation is not beyond the eyes of God. God sees everything. And if you are faithful with someone else's, God will open the opportunity for your promotion. That's what you have to trust. See, we want the promotion to come. And God says, are you willing to put out now? Because number two, look at this. Number two, private disciplines readies us for public ministry. See, what you do in private when nobody's watching is what gets you ready for that public spotlight. We love stories like this. David succeeds. We love to see people come onto the scene and God do amazing things in our life. But if we fail to realize all that was happening before that, see, anybody who has shown up and done anything great in our world, we love it. We see competitions in the Olympics. We see some team arising and doing something that we are all astounded by or some other feat in our world, a musician or something else that we fail to look back and see all the hours spent when nobody was watching, when they were grueling and disciplining themselves to be ready for their challenge. How much more that we, the people of faith, should be drawing into God, knowing him, being faithful to God, even when we don't see anything from without. Because see, if you're more motivated by the circumstances around you, you will never, never be ready when the time really comes. See, that would be as foolish as saying, you know what? I've always wanted to run a marathon. So when the opportunity presents itself, I'll get ready to do so. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're going to run 25 miles and how long are you going to take to get ready for that? If you're not running a mile, two miles, five miles, 10 miles to get ready before the opportunity comes along, even if the door opens to you, you will fall flat on your face because you won't be ready. If you're not willing to discipline yourself now, then you'll never be ready for the public eye. God sees. God is faithful. The Bible says God knows what things you have need of before you even ask them. But he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You need to be dedicated today for what God's going to do in your life tomorrow. We're waiting for tomorrow to come. But God is in the right now. And you need to be faithful and committed and disciplined with what you have today. If you really do believe that tomorrow is coming. Do you understand what I mean by that? Prepare today for the opportunities God will bring your way tomorrow because you will look at the situation when the opportunity comes and you'll have a thousand excuses. Why? When all the time God just knew you weren't ready for the opportunity. Why are we blaming everybody else instead of looking in the mirror to say, what am I doing today? what God's given me today to make, because God will open those doors. God will make those opportunities. Most of the time, we, the church, are not ready for those opportunities. And it is your private disciplines that prepare you for what God wants to do in your life publicly. 
whether it's in your workplace, when nobody else is watching you, do you put out, do you give out? Do you, are you spending extra hours there? Not to brown know somebody, but to do what you have before God, to make your way, to show that you're ready in every situation because God is faithful. Nothing goes beyond his eye. Why did, see, sometimes we say, well, God, you know, God doesn't care. God's got more important things on his mind. But no, today, in the midst of the current circumstances that you're in, God cares about every little part of your life. In other words, why would he say that he knows the very numbers of the hair of your head? I know some of us are making it easier for him to count these days, but here's the deal. Why does God care about the minimal things of life? When we think he's too busy, a, we wait for the big things. No, we wait for the spectacular and miss the supernatural in the everyday affairs of life. God wants you to be ready today because your defining moments will come tomorrow and will you be ready? Number three, number three, our confidence in God comes by knowing who he is and what he will do. Not just a head knowledge. See, people all come here, they'll get excited, they'll get inspired by the message and they'll start talking smack. They kind of like remind me of my boys. Well, they'll watch something on sports and then they'll think, man, I can play that game. I'm like, dudes, you haven't even scrimmaged yet. You haven't even gotten into competition. Don't write checks with your mouth that you can't cash. You need to start <laughs> believing God today, right in the things of your life. See, David didn't wait for Goliath. He went out against a lion. He went out against the bear and he built his confidence in God. Your victories today, prepare for the victories that God will bring you tomorrow. The challenges get greater. We wait for the big one, but we ain't ready for the big one because we aren't taking the everyday challenges, the relationship challenges. Is your marriage everything you want it to be? No, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to deal with that. We don't want to. No, God's saying, believe me today. Have the conversations you need to have today. Begin to work those things out and watch what I will do in the midst of it. See, God has given us his spirit. And the way, listen to me, the way we grow intimate with God, I've been studying ahead to get ahead for some series that I wanna do in a couple months. And so I've been studying a lot about the Holy Spirit lately. And listen, I've learned again, the realization that we become most intimate with God when difficulties come our way when challenges are beyond our ability to meet it. But you see, we like our little safe and comfortable place. But that safe and comfortable place is in the shadows where we live in the land of mediocrity because we don't want to rock the boat. I want to not just rock the boat. I want to sink the boat. I want to learn to have you dependent on God because God is the same God, the God that showed up in that valley that day to give David a victory over a towering man. In fact, Goliath's, Armor, listen to this. When you study the Bible, listen to me. Goliath's armor alone weighed 125 pounds. Dude, that, that dude must have been ripped. Being 10 feet tall must help on that front, but still, lagging around 125 pounds of armor alone, his javelin head weighed 15 pounds, and he could throw that thing and hit a bullseye at 100 yards. You gotta understand why was David confident? Because he knew God. When nobody else was waiting, when nobody else was looking, he saw victory after victory. And you see, the Holy Spirit is right there with us today to meet you and your points of need, to overcome your financial difficulties, to overcome your relational difficulties, to walk through the opportunities in business and other areas of your life. God is right there to lead and direct your life. Why are you not believing for him to meet you right today in the present situations? Why are you putting off for the future what God is wanting to do in you today? Your confidence in God is because you have a rack, track record of God coming through again and again and again. And I know that if God showed up and met me in this challenge and got me out of debt. If God showed up in this situation and put my family back together. If God showed up in this situation and got me a new job, why won't God be able to meet any challenge in my life, no matter what comes my way? That's what you need to read. Your faith needs to define your life. Are you waiting? Are you waiting because you're so comfortable? There's a point where you have to step out on God. There's a point where your confidence in God requires you to get out of that safe, little comfortable place you've been in and rock your world. Trust in God. Let go of all of the things that you have been doing to sell to yourself from what's around you. Church, it's time for the church to arise because we have waited in the safe, 
uncomfortable shadows of our world where we have gone unnoticed. But God is serving notice on the church today that it's time to arise to the challenges of our times. It's time to allow the church to address the issues of our day. The Goliaths that face us of a land are not the job of our government to do, but this is the time that the church should take on the issues of racism, the issues of, uh, of financial dependency, the issues of taking care of the poor or whatever the things that challenge and scream at us to say they're insurmountable. Our God is the same, the same God that delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt is the God who's ready today to do what needs to be done in our hour. But he needs people who trust. He needs people who believe. He needs people who say, I am gonna trust God in the everyday affairs of my life so that I'm ready that no matter what comes my way, God can count on me. And lastly, listen, lastly, listen. It's having an attitude that says, whatever it takes. Now here's the question. Why did David grab five stones? Was he a bad shot? Remember, he's running at Goliath. When he faced that challenge, why was he so confident? Because he saw God come through. See, when you talk smack and there ain't nothing in you to step out. See, there are Christians, man, we, we talk smack, but then we ain't willing to stand in the hard times. When you don't know what's going on, your faith needs to define you, not the circumstances of your life. Your confidence is because you know who God is, experientially, because he's shown up again and again and again in your life. That's why you start today with the skirmishes that you do have and then allow God to build you for the champion he's called you to be. Why are you content to live a mediocre life when God has so much more for you? God has such a greater life than you. Why are you content to sit there week after week in the land of mediocrity to say, oh, home, please let go here, it doesn't matter. God cares, God has more, but he needs you to step up and trust that he is the God of our, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the same God who has shown himself again and again and again in time and in ages before is the same one that'll show up in your life today if you trust him. You gotta have the attitude, why? You gotta have the attitude, whatever it takes. Why did he gave five stones? This is something you might not know about history. It's because Goliath had four brothers. You know this. See, was he a bad shot? You don't get another shot. If you're running at a guy who has been trained to kill from his youth, if you're running at him and he's coming at you, you ain't got time to reload. What, was he a bad shot? No, he had an attitude that says, you know what? Because you know, anybody that grew up on the street, you know this. You pick a fight with somebody who has brothers. His brothers are coming after you, right? You realize, and David said, come on, Goliath, every one of your brothers, I'm calling you all out today because my God is up for the challenge. It doesn't matter how many, even if your mama comes and your daddy show up, my God is more than enough to defeat the challenges of our time. You need to know God. But here, why, why, why? Do we in the Christian community, the first time we try to believe and step out on God and things don't go exactly as we thought they would, that we're running to run. We're getting out of the situation. We're like, oh, I didn't anticipate that. No, well, you need to get some backbone. Too often what happens is this. The soldiers in God's army too often are chocolate soldiers. What do I mean by that? That means when the heat comes on, they melt away. <laughs> No, you need to get some faith that gives you a backbone that says, you know what? I don't care what challenge comes my way. I don't care what the devil roars in my faith. I am ready. My God will bring me through every situation, every test, every trial. Listen, great victories come out of what? Great battles. Yes, our faith needs to be tested. Our faith needs to show what it will do in the midst of battle because our God is the God of the armies of heaven. God knows how to show up and show off in every situation. And when your faith in God is determined to go forward in life and not sit in the land of comfort, not sit in your own mediocrity, to not sit back and allow the challenges of life to go unaddressed or the opportunities to go unanswered, but saying now, today, I will determine to allow God 
to be everything he wants to be in my life, that God is up for this challenge. God has been waiting for you because he's saying today, church, arise and shine for the light is come and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Don't be defined by what's going on around you, but be defined by what you believe. Be defined by your faith. Be defined by what God is in your life. God is mighty and ready. No challenge, no test, no temptation has ever arisen that God is not faithful to show the way in the midst of it. But you've got to be determined today to no longer sit in my complacency, to sit back. I don't want to make, I don't, I don't want to disturb anything. I don't, I don't want to wake up the devil. Yeah, he's alive and well. But guess what? Last time I checked, he is defeated. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. You and I need to recognize, I don't care what roars in your face. You need to grab opportunity by the mane and take a hold of what God will do through your life because the same God that slayed the lion in David's life is the God that will cause you to slay your lions, your bears, and the giants that tell you you can't. My word, the Bible tells me this. My God shall do all things in my life according to his riches and glory. He meets my need and I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. You need to understand God is faithful. God hasn't changed. So why do we act like the God we serve is historic? He is relevant. He is today. He is here to meet you at your point of need, to give you the opportunity to walk through your doors of opportunity that he alone can open to you. But will you be ready? Will you be ready for your defining moments. That's what I want to encourage you with today.